Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today, December 7, 2017. Uh, the, today's webinar is going to be about neurofeedback and epilepsy. Before I introduce our presenter, I'm going to just a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be available on our website, epilepsyct.com, to listen to again uh, tomorrow. It should be available. All the lines are muted. If you have a question, please type it into the chat box on the right side of your screen, and we'll take questions at the end of the presentation. I would like to thank Dr. Scholl for agreeing to discuss his use of the low energy neurofeedback system for seizure disorders. Dr. Scholl is a board certified licensed naturopathic doctor who focuses on helping patients with neurological conditions. He received his bachelor's of science in psychology and pre-med at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and went on to National University of Natural Medicine for his ND degree in Oregon. Throughout his training, he has been passionate about helping those with mental health struggles. In practice, his primary focus is working with individuals who experience brain injuries and the multiple sequel of, of such injuries, including seizure disorders. He will utilize a variety of safe, non-invasive therapies such as low energy neurofeedback, low level laser therapy, cranial sacral therapy, physical medicine, German biologic medicine, homeopathy, nutrition, botanical medicine, and lifestyle counseling to restore optimal function to the nervous system. Dr. Scholl currently works with Pediatric and Family Center for Natural Medicine in Wallingford, Connecticut, and maintains a solo practice in Madison, Connecticut. He sees patients of all ages for conditions such as autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, depression, anxiety, developmental delays, seizure disorders, migraines, headaches, digestive disturbances, and anything that impacts the brain. So thank you again, Dr. Scholl, and I'll just turn it right over to you. Great. Thanks, Allison. Yeah, I guess I do a lot of stuff. I, I don't always get to hear it all <laughs> together like that, so uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that, too. Um, you know, our focus today is going to be talking about neurofeedback uh, and seizures. Um, but I'll talk more towards the end about um, how I integrate that in with naturopathic medicine uh, to really get some great results with my patients. So, uh, okay, so first and foremost, um, I want to talk a little bit about seizures uh, and really expanding our definition of epilepsy. So uh, I'm sure the audience here is generally familiar with our classic definitions of these disorders. Uh, talking about things like grand mal seizures or petite mal seizures. Uh, and of course the media, movies and such, always de depict our grand mal seizures as kind of what people think of for seizures. And uh, that's that kind of someone drops to the floor, uh, they're shaking uh, uncontrollably. Usually it's depicted with like foaming at the mouth and people running to get something for something to bite on. Uh, and just for the record, those generally aren't a good idea to put someone in someone's mouth having a seizure. It can actually do some damage. Uh, and the whole foaming thing, that's really largely overstated for the most part. So, you know, our image of what, what are seizures is, uh, I wouldn't say totally accurate. And in fact, um, as research develops, we're finding that seizure-like activity in the brain is largely a piece of many different kinds of disorders. So um, what might be a more accurate definition, uh, kind of a mouthful here, but I would say it would be perturbed synaptic homeostasis. Uh, or what might be easier would just be seizure spectrum disorder. Because uh, that's what it really is. There's really a large uh, spectrum of uh, disabilities that can result. And you know the underlying pathology here is basically the, the brain uh, is not able to uh, properly communicate from one nerve to the next, right? So this homeostasis, this idea of uh, balance is perturbed. Uh, synapsis, synaptic, uh, refers to the communication between, between nerves. So um, when we're seeing things like grand mal seizure, right, this is like an overactivity, uh, over communication, too much uh, synaptic communication between nerves, and the other end of the spectrum is a little more like our petite mal or what 
people might think of as absence seizures, where people are just kind of, you know, maybe for 30 seconds just go completely blank uh, and nothing's registering. People have no idea what's going on. So um, we can actually see this in a, a whole host of different conditions. Uh, depression, mood disorders, schizophrenia. Uh, people have problems with learning and memory, cognition. Uh, in kids, we see it when there's problems with language development, uh, anxiety, even all the way over to Alzheimer's, dementia. Uh, these folks often have a lot of seizure-like activity occurring in the brain as well. Um, PTSD, uh, that's post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, you'll see below that I have TBI uh, slash MTBI. That stands for traumatic brain injury or mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, and I would say that of all of these things, uh, probably the most common etiology or cause of this seizure-like activity uh, is due to head injuries, brain injuries. Um, and most people will jump to thinking of, uh, you know, these really serious uh, knocks to the head that land them in the hospital, uh, concussions and things like that. What people don't always associate with head injuries are things like falling on your butt, right? So uh, interestingly, we find that even something like falling on your butt is able to create a force that translates up to the up through the body into the brain and causes shearing-like effects on the brain matter, which will disrupt the synaptic connections between nerves um, and start leading to seizure-like activity. This is one of the uh, common causes of certain types of dementia in the, the elderly. Uh, a lot of causes to, to some of these things, but so that's, that's one way we can start uh, having disruptions in how the brain can communicate with itself. Uh, and interestingly, which I think is also of important note is uh, in things like autism. We work a lot with kids with autism and adults, and the research shows that approximately 40% of these folks um, also suffer with concurrent seizure disorder. Now, I would argue, though, that uh, it's not just this comorbid, concurrent, uh, incidental thing that's happening with them. You know, autism is largely caused by injury to the brain, uh, and often in genetically susceptible folks who, uh, you know, multiple things can injure that brain, leading to seizure-like activity, and is a, is a major piece of uh, how that pathology is. So maybe we can even group autism as, uh, as part of an umbrella of uh, brain injury, kind of these traumatic brain injuries. Okay, uh, so going from there, uh, you know, often I'm working with people with any number of these conditions, uh, and the cornerstone of my practice really is uh, the neurofeedback. Uh, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, and the neurofeedback is capable of treating lots of different conditions, uh, and that's largely because they share that common factor, the seizure-like activity in the brain. So uh, for people who like pictures, I included this. Um, comes from a, a really cool article called Epilepsy as a Spectrum Disorder, uh, which was a, written back in 2011. So if people want to read more about this and really get an idea of uh, the, the total breadth of, um, of epilepsy uh, and, and really broadening their idea and definition of that, I would check this out and uh, give it a good read. It's some, I think it's some 32 pages or so, so it's not too long. Um, but really interesting. Uh, and this is one of the diagrams the author there uses, which I think can be uh, useful to get an idea of uh, where we're getting there. It's specifically, he's talking about autism in this case, but I think this applies to anything. So if we look at their, our top circle here, we're talking about enhanced excitability in the brain, uh, developing brains, any brains really. And uh, we have some sort of disruption that'll happen, a uh, head injury, a fall, uh, could be a toxic injury, uh, anything that damages the brain is going to disrupt uh, what we call plasticity. Plasticity is a term we use uh, in, in neurology or uh, whenever we're talking about the brain that refers to the brain's ability to change and be dynamic and adapt and learn. 
right? So if we lose that plasticity, people are getting stuck in um, you know, not adapting, not learning. We see pathologies like depression, anxiety, learning disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that disruption in that plasticity is often uh, what's leading to uh, uncontrolled electrical activity in the brain, AKA epilepsy. Uh, and then ultimately downstream we see cognitive deficits, things such as autism. Of course, we spoke about lots of things. And in the middle, what we see is kind of the conglomeration of all, all of these different pieces uh, where we have disruptions in synap synaptic plasticity, the synaptic receptors are disrupted, uh, signal signaling molecules of different neurotransmitters uh, that are changing. And so if this helps, hopefully it does. If not, that's fine. The idea is it, a lot of different things uh, come together. And if we group it all as just kind of a disruption in our brain's normal communication processes, we get a much better idea of what's really going on here. Uh, okay, and so other things people might be interested in. Uh, this is all kind of uh, being pioneered still. You know, we've been looking at and examining the brain uh, many, many decades. Uh, and currently, where the field's at, uh, there's this really interesting discipline called connectomics, where people are pulling in um, information from all different areas to really get an idea of how the brain works, how it connects, how it communicates. Um, so people are doing things like uh, MRIs, getting information on the, uh, from that pattern, from PET scans. You'll see on the left of this picture EEGs, that's electroencephalogram, um, neuropsychiatric uh, evaluations, so many different things to really try to map out and see um, what we can learn about the brain. I would argue we're still, despite decades of work, um, and it's still in its infancy. There's still a lot we don't understand about the brain. Um, and so uh, this will become relevant in a minute, but it's interesting if you want to learn more about where the field's at and uh, get more, just go ahead and Google connectomics and you'll see you know, some really cool stuff that people are doing to learn more about the brain. Okay, so let's get into the juicy stuff, why we're all here. Um, neurofeedback, so what is neurofeedback? Um, really, this is one type of a biofeedback. So if anyone's familiar with that term, uh, it's kind of a, I would say, a large umbrella term uh, of a lot of different kinds of devices and things. Uh, biofeedback is really just a way of uh, using a device to monitor some form of your physiology, your body's functions, and giving you information about that so that you can then change that. And um, neurofeedback is specifically a type of biofeedback that uses the EEG, or electroencephalogram, to uh, your monitoring brain waves, brain activity, and providing some type of feedback so that uh, that activity can be changed. Uh, so actually, let's take a look at that picture on our top right. What you'll see is a young boy there. He's attached to a whole bunch of wires, and five, six, seven wires there. Uh, little sensors that are placed on different spots on the head. And he's looking at a screen. You'll see a little airplane on there. And what, what's happening here is uh, the computer program uh, working with the electroencephalogram, which is monitoring his brain waves with all those wires, is trying to uh, train his brain. So it, that, that child there needs to uh, get that plane to fly right at the middle horizon, right in the middle of the screen. And he does that with his mind, right? just by uh, trying to get it to fly. He's, he's sort of willing it to happen. Uh, and so in this case, the feedback that is being delivered is through this visual uh, stimulation, um, this visual cue. And this is what I would call uh, traditional neurofeedback. This is what most people have heard of, uh, are probably most familiar with. And um, it's, it's actually different than the type of neurofeedback I do. So we'll compare those in a minute. But um, the, the, this technology uh, had started 
many decades ago um, and really started to take on back in the late 60s and early 70s. And interestingly, um, it became uh, popularized because it was a useful tool in people with uncontrolled epilepsy. So uh, at UCLA, they, uh, they were looking at all kinds of folks uh, who were on medication but still had a lot of seizure problems, a lot of epilepsy, and weren't getting better. Uh, so they started introducing uh, electroencephalograms to monitor the brain activity. And um, this technology was fairly newer at the time, but um, it, it was really successful at helping uh, remove those seizures. Um, in some cases, completely eliminating them. In other cases, uh, getting people down to like a really minimal dose of their medications uh, so that they could uh, largely live a, a normal life. It's a little bit of range and, and results, but that all depends on an individual's physiology. So um, where we're at today uh, in the last 50, 60 years of development is a bit different. I included on here a really nice reference, um, a paper called What is Neurofeedback? An update. It's from the Journal of Neurotherapy. A uh, really great journal if you're into learning about different ways to treat the brain. Uh, this works a lot with neurofeedback and biofeedback uh, as well as some other things. But this is a great paper that will tell you all about neurofeedback, uh, the different types of neurofeedback, all the different conditions it applies to and has success with, etc. Um, all right. Lens. So this is the type of neurofeedback that I do. Lens stands for low energy neurofeedback system. It was developed uh, really probably around 26 years ago by uh, the, the neuroscientist, his name is Len Oakes. And um, what happened was he, he was doing a lot of work with electroencephalogram and trying to map brains and uh, work more on the research in that area. And what he was noticing through that was that just from doing the brain scans, the quantitative electroencephalogram, um, people were getting better. And that, that was peculiar to him, and he wanted to investigate more about why that was happening. This, this all took place back in the 80s. And so uh, ultimately, through, through his research and experimentation, he was able to f figure out that any time we're using electroencephalogram to, to listen to brainwave activity, um, there's actually a signal, uh, a current that's coming back down that wire and is influencing uh, the brain at the same time. So, you know, if you were to talk to him today, he would probably go on all kinds of tangents about chaos theory and a uh, really interesting guy. Um, and probably, you know, still, still even way above my level of understanding on all these things. Um, but a great neuroscientist, and uh, what he was able to do uh, with some really creative programmers was develop a software that could utilize um, this kind of phenomena that was happening. Uh, so instead of um, essentially being able to control that signal that's coming back down the wire uh, in a very precise manner. And so... Um, what, we, what he ended up developing was a type of neurofeedback that uh, didn't utilize the type of operant conditioning in traditional neurofeedback. I hadn't mentioned that term before, but when you know we go back, this kid playing with the little uh, screen trying to get the, the plane to fly, they refer to this as operant conditioning. The, the child, the operant, is being conditioned, um, is using his conscious mind, if you will, to uh, get that airplane to do what it's supposed to. In the lens, there you'll see in this picture here, there's a few wires. The therapist is off to the side of the computer. There's no operant conditioning that happens here. It's not conscious. Right? He doesn't have to sit there and play a video game with his mind. Uh, and so we're actually influencing things at the subconscious level. So a little different in its effects, 
Uh, some might refer to this as kind of a microcurrent stimulation. I don't even know if that's entirely accurate because it's not really any different uh, in terms of strength or what's happening with other types of neurofeedback. It's just done in a more uh, precise manner. It's more controlled. And so because we're working on the subconscious level, what we're finding is that we really get very similar results to the other types of feedback, neurofeedback, but in much, much shorter periods of time. And we'll compare those in a minute on the next slide. Um, but real quick, just pointing out a, a couple really cool studies. Uh, one study here I've linked to, again, from the Journal of Neurotherapy, um, that, that uh, kind of, they looked at 100 different patients at uh, Stone Mountain Center in New York and um, their conclusions there on the lens treatment is that it's very efficient and effective in rapidly reducing a wide range of symptoms uh, and particularly produces rapid improvements in the first five to six sessions. And so this is really what led me to using the lens and why it's um, my neurofeedback of choice is that we can really see great quick results. And let's compare those a little bit. TNFB, traditional neurofeedback versus the lens. As I mentioned, one is the traditional is operant conditioning. Maybe we can call the lens some kind of transcranial stimulation. Uh, in traditional neurofeedback, we've got this kind of engaging, sort of fun video game-like thing that people are doing. Um, and, you know, that might be a good fit for some folks. Maybe we've got kids who really want to be doing that, and that's interesting to them. But I find that the lens really tends to be uh, more useful in a, a large group of people. You know, if we're, we have kids who won't sit still and focus or just don't want to spend 45 minutes playing this video game with their brain, uh, the treatment with the lens really takes maybe five minutes, five to ten minutes, because the, every site that we're treating takes a couple seconds. And so uh, we're able to do this on you know, little screaming infants, um, people with severe disabilities, people who aren't even conscious, for example. So there's a lot, a lot more uh, types of conditions and people we can treat. It's a, it's a, it's a passive thing. You know, person just sits there. Um, if I go back to this picture, their eyes aren't closed, but generally, if people with their eyes closed, they just sit comfortably still, and they don't have to do anything else. Uh, and when we compare the efficacy of the two traditional neurofeedback, uh, you're really looking at around 40 treatments on average to uh, get the full benefit of the, the treatment. With the lens, the average looks more like 20 treatments. Now, um, that's kind of across the, the board, 20 treatments for all the people who have used lens, um, you know, based statistically on a, a, a lot of data. But in my practice, I would say I've I've never gotten to 20 treatments with someone. Uh, being a naturopathic physician, I have a lot of tools in my tool belt. And um, if it, you know, I find that people are usually getting the most out of the neurofeedback really between uh, 6 to 15 visits, treatments, if you will. Of course, it depends on the individual. Um, but if I'm getting upwards 12, 13, 14 treatments, um, with someone and we're not seeing continuous large improvements each week, then really I start looking uh, at different things. Maybe that means uh, doing further lab workup or um, trying some other modalities or different methods that I might use. You know, I don't like to, uh, I, for lack of a better term, uh, keep beating a dead horse, right? You know, no reason to keep using something if we see the results kind of slowing down or plateauing. And in my experience, uh, we, we get the most out of the neurofeedback really before 20 treatments. So, so that, yeah, that brings me to one of my last points here. So naturopathic medicine, um, the audience may or may not be familiar with that, but uh, a large, you know, if we take this to the, the principles of naturopathic medicine and how I integrate this, um, we, we have our six principles or, or tenets. 
we call them, of natural medicine. And uh, a lot of these we share with the rest of the medical world. Um, like, for example, the first one is first do no harm. Uh, that's the same for any osteopath or medical doctor, chiropractor, etc. Um, and, you know, that's one of the main reasons I use the low energy neurofeedback is because it's a really safe, uh, non-invasive form of therapy. And it's often one of the first places I will start out with people, uh, you know, if deemed appropriate. I always make sure I do a really thorough intake. Usually takes a good 90 minutes to two hours to get someone's full history and really understand what's going on with them. So I always you know, preempt any of that uh, with a really thorough history. And it's not uncommon to start with the neurofeedback. Uh, and then as we see improvements, people's function is improving. Um, in the case of seizures and epilepsy, that looks like fewer and fewer episodes, followed by uh, less and less intense episodes. And then um, if at that point we need to do more, then we do more. Um, for me, generally, uh, if we're following this therapeutic order, starting with the least uh, dangerous, least um, invasive therapies, and we work our way up where really pharmaceutical medications, I'd say, would be at the end of the line, uh, when all these other therapies in between uh, haven't gotten us to where we need to. Uh, of course, that's not always how patients come into the office. Most people come in already on medications, and so uh, we're able to do a lot of work with improving that and optimizing that brain function so they need less or none of those medications in many cases. Um, and as I mentioned, we're, I'm always looking at everything that's been going on in this person's history. We really want to be treating the whole person. If someone comes in to be treated for a seizure disorder, I'm not just looking at let's control seizures in your brain. I'm going to be talking to people about their lifestyle, their diet. Many people are aware of like ketogenic diets that can help seizure disorders. Uh, we're, we're talking about um, even uh, familial uh, passed down things. Um, uh, I would say another thing that's worthwhile for people to look into, just as an aside, is um, a type of therapy called family constellations. Really cool stuff. Something that helps kind of resolve these family of origin issues that many of us are born into this world with uh, and are, are kind of given to us by our parents, not necessarily genetically, but uh, psychologically uh, as well. And so, uh, even going back to some of these other levels, have sometimes a profound effect on people's physical problems, such as seizure. Um, and it's always about trying to find that underlying cause. Where did this disorder happen? Uh, when did it first start? Uh, what's really uh, going on here? Um, and and this, this really becomes important, uh, particularly if working with neurofeedback and we hit one of those plateaus where maybe a lot of things have changed, but these other things haven't changed. Uh, let's dial it back. Let's look at your genetics. Let's see what else is going on here that's keeping your symptoms in place. So we're always trying to find all the different pieces. And we want to remove any obstacles. Right? So if, let's take an example. Uh, some, a patient has, comes in, any given problem. The neurofeedback is helping them out. They, they get a treatment. They do well for two, three days, but then their symptoms come back. We see this pattern each time. Uh, then I start thinking, right, what else is going on? Something is still affecting their brain. We might have to look at see if there's any heavy metal exposures. We might need to see if they're living in a moldy house. Right? Mold and aflatoxin is probably the most toxic thing that we know of to the brain. So you know, while neurofeedback is the cornerstone of what I do, there's always so much more going on with people. We always need to make sure uh, there isn't something else uh, causing damage or keeping things in place. Uh, and ultimately, it's about, uh, like I said, being non-invasive, and let's do what we can to get the body to heal itself. Right? Nature is pretty brilliant. Humans aren't that great yet at understanding it. Uh, you know, I mentioned the connectomics. 
understanding the brain is really still in its infancy. So um, I'll say one more thing about neurofeedback, the traditional neurofeedback versus the low energy neurofeedback. Traditional neurofeedback is usually preempted with a quantitative electroencephalogram. Right? Let's see what the brain's doing. And the training that follows is presuming that we know what the brain should be doing and trying to get your brain to train into that. The low energy neurofeedback uh, removes that step. We can't presume to know what the brain is, is supposed to be doing. There's still a lot we don't know about the brain. So it's really more of a stimulus to get the brain to start changing, to rewire itself, and we let you know the power of nature decide what to do with that. It's more about removing the stuckness. Let's get this brain unstuck. And when we do that, it's very capable of reorganizing itself in a really ideal way. Uh, and then of course, I like to do things like this today, where I get to teach you about what I do. Uh, hopefully, this has given you some more information, maybe better understanding of neurofeedback. Um, certainly, take a look back in the presentation at some of those sources if you want to do some more reading. Some really cool stuff there, and um, that's that's what I've got for you guys today. So let's take a moment. I would like to open it up if anyone has any questions. And I'm sorry if I sounded too rambly on some of this, but. <laughs> oh, thank you, Dr. Scholl. Oh, this is Allison. Um, I am waiting for any questions to come in the chat box. Um, so if there's a a question out there, please let us know. I don't see anything at this point. I did have one question, though, Dr. Schull. Sure. Um, so, you know, as, as a parent, we're always concerned about starting something new with our child. And um, are there any potential side effects, uh, negative side effects, in the neurofeedback? Oh, sure. So, um, and I should have addressed that because that's probably one of the most common questions. And I always make sure people are well informed about uh, about that before starting treatment. Um, luckily, the, the low energy neurofeedback is really safe. Um, but if if we were to do say too much of it, uh, which what might look like um, we do too many sites, right? So there's 21 sites locations on the scalp that we use for treatment, and the strength of a treatment is based on largely how many sites we do in a visit. And if I were to do too many of those, um, it can cause some temporary uh, aggravation, um, meaning that could look like some extra irritability. Uh, if someone's suffering with tantrums, maybe they're going to have a tantrum. Um, it, it, in seizures, it's like, well, maybe we'll see a seizure from that. Um, it doesn't usually show up that, that same day, day of treatment. It can happen during the week. So, you know, we're providing the the effort, the the uh, the motivation for the brain to change, if you will. We see changes all week. So, if anything, we tend to see if there is an aggravation, something shows up within the first couple, two, three days, and it's really always just a, a temporary aggravation of that their normal symptoms. And it's really important for me to get any feedback if that does happen so that I know uh, how to change things on my end. Now that being said, when I do these really thorough intakes in the beginning, um, we go through a lot of information and questions so I can uh, be really uh, much more precise about how much to use and where to start so we can all together avoid that. So it doesn't really come up very often. Uh, every now and then you get these really, really sensitive folks. Um, and despite my best efforts, and maybe you even do a single site, um, there's still a little bit of aggravation that might happen. But like I said, it's always temporary. It's really just we push the brain physiology a little too hard. Uh, things will come back to baseline. And then uh, we do less next time. And it, it is often a really good fit. And so my goal is always to get really uh, gradual, incremental, weekly improvements without any of those aggravations happening. Thank you. Um, we have a, oh, go ahead. I was just, did that answer everything? Anything else about that? No, I think that definitely, that definitely answered the question. Um, we, we have a question, and I'm not quite sure what the question exactly means, um, but it says, do you use big data? I'm not sure if you understand that. Uh, big, big data? 
B-I-G, big? Uh, not really a term I'm familiar with. Okay. If the person that asked that question, if you want to expand on that, that would be very helpful. Yeah, I'm wondering if they mean uh, using like the uh, quantitative electroencephalogram uh, that's used in traditional neurofeedback. Maybe, you know, I mentioned they often will start with a total brain scan uh, and learn what's going on in different parts and then uh, that, you know, let's say a patient is found to have, you know, low alpha function in this area or high beta amplitudes in this area and then the program uh, that they put the person through is trying to, you know, decrease those betas, increase those alphas. Um, and as I mentioned, that, that's not something we do with the lens uh, because we're not, uh, we're not trying to force the brain pathology into those things. Um, we're really just freeing it to be able to heal itself. Okay, thank you. So there's to expand on the, the, the question, it was um, big data is a database for epilepsy patients such as by cure. Do you, you don't, you're not in any of those types of databases or anything, are you? No, no. 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 You know, if we go back to, again, thinking of seizures and epilepsy as a spectrum disorder, um, the neural feedback is having a really huge impact on how our nerves communicate with each other. And we see changes in blood flow uh, and neural connectivity. Um, you know, if, I don't know if I can paint a kind of visual picture in folks' heads, but it, when we think of nerves, we, you've got one nerve that's got the hands, if you will, from multiple other nerves attaching to it, and that one's got its big arm touching some other nerve, and it creates this really complex web of connections and the way the brain changes and learns is by moving these arms and changing its connections and and so uh, this really just kind of pushes it to do more of that to rewire itself um, and so how the um, neurotransmitters are flowing uh, which nerves are communicating with uh, which all changes so we're kind of taking this down to a uh, a different level of um, uh, we're not using the I don't know I don't know how to say that we're not using these presumptions from that data we're we're allowing the physiology to handle things on its own does that make sense yeah I think so and the other question is also, um, you know, I, I often get asked, you know, well, is this going to work for my child? Well, this statistics, you know, working to help treat my child's epilepsy. Do you have any statistical data on the actual use of it and if it's effective? I know that's hard because even here, well, you know, somebody will ask, well, if this, is this the right medication or is this the right treatment option? And it's really hard because everybody is so individualized. Therefore, the treatments respond to each person very differently. But do yeah. you have any data on that? Uh, yeah, so a couple of those papers I referenced in the presentation uh, do, do have that data um, and the research there. And it does go all the way back to, like I said, the 60s and 70s where um, neurofeedback was being used um, to in, improve the treatments uh, of epilepsy. It's really where the whole field started. Um, so, uh, and it's been effective in that way for, you know, since then uh, and continues to be refined and improved as well. Um, so, yeah, I would, I would go back and hit some of those studies in the presentation. Uh, if you want to take a look there and see, uh, you can even reference out to, to more of the studies. But uh, there is a lot of data uh, on its effic efficacy, but... Uh, I would say, it, as far as will this work for my individual uh, in front of me, my my kid, my patient, my person, um, that, that's impossible to know, and that's the case for any treatment, any medication, any supplement, anything, um, because you know, like I said, if if someone is, uh, you know, has certain genetic variations that are leading to uh, them being predisposed to seizure activity 
well, we, we can't change those genes, right? So there's always going to be something going on there. Um, if someone's getting seizures because they had a head injury, oh, absolutely, we can get rid of all of those seizures. All right, that, I know the lens is perfect for those kinds of situations. So depending on our cause uh, and what, what the real, why they're having this seizure-like activity, it's probably a little more indicative in an individual of whether or not it would be able to help. So I would say maybe start there. If you, you, know, you see a history of uh, your child hitting their head on something uh, or even some kind of trauma during birth uh, that would have you know, essentially equated to a head, head trauma. There's a good chance you'll see really quick results with the lens. Uh, if there are some kind of genetic pieces there um, or uh, someone's living in a moldy house, they've had heavy metal toxicity, we're not going to see the same results with the lens. We're going to have to address those other pieces first, and then later we'll see uh, much, much more improvements with the lens. So I take everyone on a case-by-case -case individual basis for that reason. Um, so I can't always say that this will definitely help, but, but I know it's safe, so I say we can try. Let's see what patterns change, what, what changes, what patterns are developed, and I can often tell based on those patterns if we need to be addressing something else. Um, so either people start getting better right away, or they kind of maybe get a little better, and then uh, they kind of just always go back. That tells me, all right, we need to see what else is going on here. Very good. So, Thank you so much. I don't see any other questions at this point in time. Dr. Scholl, did you have anything you wanted to add um, before we close out the session? Um, uh, not, not so much, but uh, if anyone needs my contact info, uh, please feel free to reach out, uh, pick my brain for more questions if they come up later. I'm always the person who, in the moment, can't think of any questions, and then five minutes later I have a hundred of them. So <laughs> feel free to email me. Um, I've got my uh, personal website up here as well. There's a little bit more information about neurofeedback uh, in that regard. and. Yeah, I'm happy to talk at length about any of these things. Um, well, I guess we can leave it at that. Well, thank you very much. If anybody feels the need to contact Dr. Scholl, please do so and let him know that you heard about him through this webinar through the Epilepsy Foundation of Connecticut. I thank you again, Dr. Scholl, for your time and everybody who is on this webinar. And we will be posting this again tomorrow on our website to review again. And please. Always check back to our website, epilepsyct.com, for more updates on upcoming webinars. Thank you, everybody, and have a great day. Thank you, Allison.